Okay. Um, whenever I am next to an IT installation, it always breaks down. So <laughs> I don't be, I'm the next keynote speaker, so it probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to leave. Um, but instead of just hanging around doing nothing, I thought we could maybe just talk about something that we're all here for. Um, Tabby suggested just talking to you generally and asking you what things are on your minds. I mean, what are, you, what are your burning issues? What do you think, what are the problems you're facing in either your daily lives or your, your place of work? Anybody want to kick off? And as I said before, I'm really good at waiting. <laughs> on your feet so we can hear you. And maybe a mic. Your so stra stress management. Your private life with your business life, your children, the communication. The OK. Um, I'm not one of these women that can multitask. So, Lord, could you be my assistant? <laughs> so, OK, stress management. That is an important, yeah. And managing, managing the kids. Yes, because I think that now there is something new in our society. Everything is going faster and faster. And I think that you have more and more stress, less time to, to manage, to think, to take a little bit distance. I think that it's new. It's, it was different 10 years ago, five years ago, and it's more and more. And so... OK, yes. that's a good point. Let, let's do a poll. Who here thinks that stress management is a, an important fact in their lives? Oh, wow. <laughs> like every, almost, almost everybody. OK, so good, good point. Anybody want to throw something else in? Yes, sir. Changes, um, acquisitions, mergers, and we are integrating um, on a regular basis, it almost it feels, new people. Yeah. Uh, with different cultures and um, a different way of working and different backgrounds. Uh, okay. I mean, this, this is going to be a great point for Tabby to address later because that she's very much um, into innovation and embracing disruption, and Paul as well is very into that. Okay, great. What are, any other? Hi, uh, Rhonda from MasterCard. I think I would like to build on that because as MasterCard is an innovation technology company, um, we, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of change within uh, our industry and many industries because of the, what we're calling the digital transformation. And change can be, let's say, accepted easily by a few, but it is stressful and it is sometimes seen as a threat to some uh, within organizations. So um, to your point, change, um, is, is one of the reasons for stress, but also the integration of not only new people as mergers and acquisitions, MasterCard's bought quite a few companies, but also the integration of new technology and new ways okay. of doing Te things. Technology, and that's definitely on our agenda when we get up and running. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. It was mentioned already, but uh, maybe we could deepen it a little bit. The fact that many young, qualified, talented women nevertheless hesitate to put themselves forward to go for managerial positions um, and what could be done to, let's say, encourage them so to support, come forward. support young talent. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to be covering that. We're actually, Kiara's a millennial on our panel, so she's going to give us a fresh eyes perspective. So anybody else? Yes? You've got the mic. Hello, yes. Um, relationships, actually. Um, I'm a freelancer, and I've also worked as, a, as a, an interim manager. You always change people in your surrounding and that's uh, a source of stress because also you play different roles as a professional as a personal uh, as a private person you were asking for sources of, uh, of, of so you're, you're issues. looking for longevity of as a freelance you're not getting sort of but security in relationships also professionally you have all these different relationships and you have to manage all those roles all the time and, and, and that changes as your company, as there's a, a, a rotation of, of people around okay. you. So probably the challenges of being a freelance, you mean an insecurity of being a freelance? Relationships. Oh, relationships. Okay, relationships, freelancing. 
Okay. Hello, uh, Claire Godding, uh, responsible for diversity and inclusion at uh, BMP Paribas Fortis. Uh, I completely join the, what the aspects which were mentioned. I would say for us, a very important aspect for the moment is the intergenerational management. How can we get the generations connecting to each other um, on, on the best way so that uh, I think we, we are convinced that both parts have really something to bring to the other. How can we okay. do that one? It cross generational, intergeneration. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing, but then at ING as Claire. Okay. Oh, uh, the competition! Um, <laughs> so we're friends, um, <laughs> frenemies. Um, but I have I have the same question as Claire, but then more like uh, I hear it today again. How can we get rid of the stigma that older people are less good at dealing with disruption and, and, and innovation? Um, for the for the Belgian government, we're already older generation from 45. I'm wondering <laughs> if I look around me, how many people identify themselves with that and also you know is, is it true that the older generation is less you know current with the digitalization and, and the disruption that's happening in the society i'm a twitter addict yes. so i'm living proof <laughs> exactly. that it can be done i think are we good to go we will go with a slightly different version but the slides are up so. okay perfect um well, thank you for being good sports. I think what, what we've done is we've set a framework and we know what questions are on your mind. Um, the way this is going to be set up is I'm just going to frame um, the topic of navigating disruption. Then we're going to call on the panel and they are going to give their, they all come from different backgrounds. I'll introduce them later. And we will have a discussion amongst ourselves. It will be very organic. And then we'll leave 10 minutes at the end where um, you can do Q&A. So, sound OK? So, pardon? Oh, we don't have the jingle. <laughs> All right, I'm completely screwed up now. <laughs> um, OK, so clearly you know who I am. Is this working? There you go. So, um, navigating diversity in a disrupted society. So that's, we've already talked about that. And um, Emma Stone, the Hollywood actress, in an awards acceptance speech for La La Land, said, the world's in a bit of a thing at the moment. And actually, although it's not a very profound statement or a very complex statement, did we all understand what she meant? Yeah? The world is in a thing. It's not just in one thing. It's in lots of things. And for me, um, I have to say that I'm probably having a bit of an existential crisis because everything I hold dear about diversity and inclusion seems to be under threat. And as women who, oh, and men and women, who happily are working in and living in a developed and relatively stable environment, the question is, how do we nudge the gender balance movement forward? But at the same time, we're being called upon to support the interests of women in other geographies. So in January, I don't know if anybody else went on it, I went on a march or a rally in support of the women in Washington. Did, did anybody, was anybody else there? Um, so that was one thing. I never, ever expected that I would have to be supporting American women whose reproductive rights are being dialed back. Never, ever thought. Um, in Russia, they have decriminalized domestic violence, OK? Until a bone is broken. So it's totally fine to beat your wife to a pulp or your partner to a pulp as long as you don't break any bones. It just seems incredible. Playboy are going back to publishing naked pictures again to, because the sales are down. And the other thing that is very striking is the spike in misogyny that we're seeing, particularly on social media, right? So the burning question is, how can we keep gender on the agenda? And I'm a little bit of the his a historian for the group because one of the things that I believe, if you want to understand where you're going, you have to understand where you've been. So going forward, what can we learn from the past? So there are four waves of 
feminism, which we're going to talk about. And there they are waving to you. Um, the first wave was in the 60s. And I sadly missed the 60s. It may not look like it, but I did. And um, I joined... So the 50s were, were all these statutory regulations were put, made, made, put into law. So I joined in the second stage, mid-second mid stage, which was about implementation. And I don't think a lot of people realise that it has only been 40 years since men and women were paid differently for the same jobs. Can you believe that? Um, men, women could not have a credit card without a male signature. Okay? You know this, right, Rhonda? You can attest to that. Um, couldn't get a bank loan. You couldn't get a mortgage without your father or your husband signing, um, co-signing. Single women didn't have access to contraception in a lot of geographies. I'm not talking necessarily here in Belgium, but in a lot of geographies. And it was not very uncommon, and women were not allowed to wear trousers to either school or work. So that was only 40, 45 years ago, max. So for the first time, we're seeing men and women competing for jobs in the same workplace. OK? So that's really important to know. And when I started work, I was one of three out of 150 graduate trainees and working in the steel industry. And it, it was at a time when the superwoman concept came. And one of the things that Superwoman did was that she gave us permission to work. Now, that sounds a bit odd. You may not recognize. Well, I can see some people recognize that. Gave us permission to work. And we were called career girls. And we were sort of an odd part of the female species that no one knew quite what to do with. And they weren't, it, it's not a compliment. So that was really important. So eventually, the having it all movement came along in the 80s. And this was Helen Gurley Brown. And she told us that you could have great jobs, great careers, great relationships, great husbands, great kids, great sex. And that was at a time when gray was a color, not shade. You could safely put your kids in the playroom, and there wouldn't be a whip in sight. So they called us then working mums. So what that did was it immediately set us apart from um, non-working mums or real mums. And we were just still not real. So fast forward to later into the, into the 90s, which was the third wave of feminism. And a lot of the focus was on LGBT, um, violence, uh, domestic violence, um, sexism, and color and race, ethnicity coming into the equation. And it wasn't long before us working mums realised that having it all was doing it all. OK, have we got something wrong with our lights? Here we are. Doing it all. So I don't know if anybody recognises and identifies with that. So in the early noughties, there was still, still in the third wave, um, people were starting to feel, OK, we've got this really wrong because we've actually created a divide between women of colour, mothers that wanted not to work, and women who wanted to work. And truthfully, it was a bit of a mess. So this is what happens now. Um, a, journal, a British journalist said, you don't need a pair of breasts to take a child to the dentist. And that was because women were doing all the domestic work. And even now, women do 80% of household chores. OK, so that's something we need to factor in. Um, at the same time, I think Isabella um, set up Jump. And my daughter graduated from law school, which is not a particularly impactful event. But one of the things was she started to phone me, and she was going through exactly the same things as I went through when I had started my early career. And this is what I felt. And, and I'm sure the boards of Microsoft and Google, they didn't sit down and talk about the same shit. What they did was that they talked about, OK, what's holding us back? And they talked about unconscious bias and second generation discrimination. Now, I see some heads nodding and others not. Anybody doesn't know what unconscious bias is? OK, it's the small intangible things and assumptions 
that people make around gender. So it's assumed that a woman won't want promotion because she's pregnant. It is assumed a man will not want to take time off to look at, uh, look at the, ch the, after the children. So these are what we call gen gender-coded qualities that they're associated with one gender or another. And a lot of male-coded practices that are actually blocking our organizations and stopping us from moving forward. So what have we got now? We're looking at the challenges. I don't know if I need some help here. Um, this is what the challenges that we're going to, to, to do and look at in the panel, which we're going to have later. And I've, I've divided them into, into six subtitles, but they're all very interlinked. And they're really their questions. I actually don't have the answers, but these are the questions that I think we should be asking ourselves. The first is political changes. I mean, one of the most important um, demographic changes is the aging population declining birth rate. What are governments going to do about that? Because that is going to impact every aspect of our culture. The second element is the rise of the far right and the populist movement, because that is isolationist and protectionist. And this is something that we have built up over time of being open. And I think Paul is going to discuss that, how we should deal with this. We're talking about cultural changes, sexism, and bias. And as was said this morning, I don't know if anybody was at the forum this morning, that we are still in our daily cultural lives have deeply embedded sexist codes of or gendered codes. Um, just for instance, um, I read research last week that girls of five already believe that they are less capable than a six-year-old boy, okay? Girls of eight and nine have eating disorders. So it's really important that these things are dealt with very openly. And of course, once again, the rise in misogyny, which we've had in the last maybe year. I mean, has anybody else noticed that? I, has been, to me, absolutely horrifying, and particularly online. So the next one is the, I hope it's going to be, the economic changes, the gig economy. Um, I'm not totally convinced about the gig economy. I think that it's because the main, the main um, economy, the regular economy, is, is faltering. Tabby is going to give us a very convincing um, overview of why we should embrace that change and the opportunities that it offers. But research from um, corporate crossovers said that women go freelance, for example, that they take a 32% drop in salary. The um, European Union has, is highlighting an issue for women about potential old age poverty, pension poverty, because of disrupted working, continuous working. Okay, so these, I think we have to look at the risk and the opportunity and how they're balanced. Technology, we're all concerned about artificial intelligence. So, um, World Economic Forum says we're going to leave fi lose 5 million jobs by 2020. But um, once again, Tabby's got this great input about how these are actually going to create jobs for women. So there's a lot of discussion out there about how this is going to happen. And something about technology I really like is that now with social proofing sites like um, In Her Sight and Fairy, Fairy God Boss, there are um, now corporate employer brand, brands can be monitored. So if corporates treat their women badly or their women employees badly, they have the opportunity to rank and discuss that in, on the public domain. And I think that's going to be, eventually, when they take off in Europe, that's going to be a game changer. Um, the next one is the workplace. We've heard a lot of this, all the things that you're talking about, um, continuous employment, lack of flexibility, male-coded environs, ma male tone documentation, all of these things, how can we change those and get them to be less, well, more gender neutral? And the last, the last element, and that's obviously, this is very pertinent to what everyone was talking about, is relationships. Um, women are still doing 80% of household work. We're still within um, our own relationships, but are behaving in what I call the CDO, the Chief Domestic Officer. So is that because women won't let go, okay? 
or is it because gentlemen don't step up? So that's something that, that women also need to um, think about. And as women become more financially independent, what we're seeing is that they are either opting to stay single longer, they're not having um, kids as early or at all, and in some cases they're not even choosing to have relationships. And also the whole nation, the notion of sex, sex, when I say sex, I mean gender has become much more convoluted as transgender and other, other um, gender issues are, are brought to, to the fore. And the other thing that is really important, that men are equally trapped by these gender stereotypes. Um, and we've seen this because one of the greatest causes of death for men under 40 is suicide. 75% of men say they want to spend more time with their families. So the way we're operating, although it's very, it's very disruptive, there are parts of it, I think, are on the verge of implosion. So I think we've got a lot to talk about. We've got diverse views on our panel. But this is what the situation looks like now. This is exactly how it was when I started my career. So women are lagging behind, the needle's not moving, and the alpha male is pulling to the front. And I was very dismayed when I, when I saw an announcement from the White House which said the alpha male is back. And that filled me with absolute horror. And so my final note as someone from my generation who really expected it to be like all over and done and dusted, and I would be in a room of female CEOs, um, this is how I feel. <laughs>